two four stands up a shame it's on radio four people stand up it's an elegant use of language <laughs> friend of mine said your job's just words in it <laughs> firstly never say in it to me <laughs> i'm the wrong generation secondly in it yeah, isn't it <laughs> Anthropologists tell you that we develop language to communicate with each other during hunts. I don't buy that. I think language is more likely to have developed spontaneously, probably between a cave couple who were entirely furious with each other, just incandescent with rage and wholly incapable of expressing their emotion. Decades of pent-up fury standing opposite each other in the cave mouth going, vrind, 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 until something had to give. And one of them finally snapped and went, yet, yet, tit! <laughs> and the other one went, oh, it's all coming out now, isn't it? <laughs> Never clean this cave up. This place is a tip. Well, why didn't you say something before? Well, I couldn't, could I? <laughs> You're a pig, you are. My mother warned me about you. Oh, really? How? <laughs> <laughs> From that moment, right, where there was no language at all, we've evolved to a stage now where there are 5,000 recorded human languages. 5,000 recorded human languages, which I think goes some way to explaining why the people in the part of South East London where I live don't appear to have chosen one as yet. Yeah. <laughs> Still looking through the catalogue. Yeah. Leave me alone. Looking for the woman with the mouth's words for you, map it. <laughs> Some of the spoken languages are, are astonishing because they're not all, as we think of languages, they're not all verbal. They don't sound like the languages we're used to, like English or, or French or Italian, Spanish, Chinese, even, you know. Like the Bantu people, right? The Bantu people of Southern Africa. Oh! <laughs> Talking through a burp, that's a charm you have it, isn't it? The, uh... <laughs> Bloody M&S food. The, uh... <laughs> These aren't just burps. <laughs> These are hot bubbles of oral flatus. <laughs> elegantly nudging their way up my esophagus. <laughs> The Bantu people of Southern Africa speak with a system of clicks and tuts. They use the cheeks and the roof of the mouth, the glottal stop at the throat and the tongue like that. They're constantly surrounded by horses they've no need of, these people. <laughs> Bantu for go-away horses. They're, you know, there's... It's hopeless. It's hard on the horses as well, the mixed messages. You say you want me, you push me away, what am I to think? <laughs> Language became really powerful for humans when we started to write it down, and more importantly, when we started to print it. It's printing that was the, the, that was the big step. Before printing, you have to rely on monks to copy everything out longhand, and that just takes forever. Never get a monk to take a phone message for you, because it just <laughs> takes ages. Phil called, big P, colour it in gold, draw dragons through the middle. Just, just tell me. The whole vow of silence thing doesn't help with taking the messages in the first place. <laughs> mm -hmm. If you ever phone a monastery and there doesn't appear to be anybody there, just keep talking. If you keep at it long enough, you can get one of them to break eventually. If you spend long enough going, hello, 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 eventually one of them goes, I'm bloody monk! Oh, you little... <laughs> I'm in trouble now, thanks to you. I'm going to be holding by the abbot and giving a really strong looking at... <laughs> As ever on Four Stands Up, we have uh, spared no, uh, no expense. We've used the licence fee, even though that's only really for telly and we're not supposed to dip into it. Uh, <laughs> we can hire some of the finest comedians currently working live in this country, and that is what we have for you this evening. Three wonderful comedians. Would you please welcome the first of those, Mr. Matt Kirshen! <laughs> How are you, people? My name's Matt. Uh, I guess I'll tell you this. Um, my whole family is kind of Jewish. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't personally follow the religion at all, because... because bacon's nice. <laughs> Is it, bacon's really delicious. It's really... Good. I'm not going to deny myself the nicest meat in the world. <laughs> on the orders of a god I don't believe in, yeah? <laughs> It'd be like driving below the speed limit when you know there's no cameras. <laughs> because there's interesting times with the religion at the moment. I keep hearing this expression, the battle between science and religion. Have you heard that? Who will win? Who will win in the battle of science against religion? Well, clearly science. It has laser guns. 
More so in America. I just got back from there. I was, I was on a plane, and this, this Texan woman was sat down next to me, and she was scared of flying. She turned around to me mid-flight. She said, you know, I just think it's incredible that something this big and heavy can stay up in the air. <laughs> no, 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 give her the benefit of the doubt. Wait, wait, wait. Because to her credit, it's an impressive scientific achievement. But then to her discredit, she followed that one up with, I guess we'll never know how. <laughs> yeah, well, you'll never know how. <laughs> There's a difference. I'm sure someone must have an inkling. <laughs> someone somewhere must have a vague idea. The aviation industry is very successful. It can't all be built on guesswork. <laughs> they can't still just keep trying different shapes of plane to see if it goes up. <laughs> Let's try the cube next. <laughs> but what an amazing magical world that woman lives in. Just think about it. Her every day is a mystery, a marvel, a world of wonder. Imagine being her. You wake up in the morning, you open your front door and there's a car. How does it move? <laughs> Television. Who are these tiny people? Why are they talking to me? How come I can't talk back? <laughs> I think that's why they wave at the end of American game shows. It's for people like her don't get upset. <laughs> Bye. See you tomorrow. How does she think the plane works? Think it goes up in the air because we're all good of heart. We behaved ourselves all year, been so good. So as an extra special reward, Jesus picks up the plane and carries it across the country, sets it down again at the other end. As we near our destination, the pilot just stops believing ever so slightly. <laughs> we just drift back down to Earth on a cloud of magic and hope. Because to most people, flying's mundane, right? I guess to just about everyone in this room, flying's no longer special. And it used to be within all of our lifetimes. Think back 15, 20 years ago, flying was an event. It isn't now. My parents went on holiday last week. I presume they made it. <laughs> Because I would have got at least a text. That <laughs> plane gone down. Sad face. <laughs> and it never used to be that way. Remember 15, 20 years ago, we'd land in another country. What's the first thing we'd do? We'd run to the nearest payphone, right? My mum would phone her dad. He would tell his wife she runs to the top of the hill and light the beacon. <laughs> and the whole village would rejoice. Like, they made it, people, they made it. Music and dancing, little Ewoks going crazy. It was an event. <laughs> Text messaging has killed the beacon. <laughs> My mum started texting recently. I don't know if anyone in this room is in this position or anyone listening at home. But it's the acronym she has trouble with, the abbreviations, LOL. And LOL, which, you know, in the world of texting is laughs out loud. Ha ha, I found that thing funny. It's almost a word in its own right, isn't it? I'm dreading comedy in a few years' time. I'll tell a joke and the audience will just go, LOL. <laughs> Lol, right? Yeah, man. Ruffle. <laughs> but that's what it means in the world of texting. But in my mum's mind, it means lots of love. <laughs> no, I know. Ah, oh, it's really sweet. My mum loves me. That's great. But it's also incredibly confusing. And not a little bit sinister as well. I was getting all these mundane text messages of her that had inexplicable laughter at the end of them. <laughs> Like some mad, nervous tick that she developed for the first time in her life in text message form. <laughs> Left your keys on the windowsill. Ah! <laughs> Hope you have a safe flight. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to leave you. You have no idea how lovely this is compared to the normal gigs I end up doing. <laughs> The Radio 4 audience, you don't behave like a normal gig. I, I did something I'd never do normally. I just left my bag unattended. <laughs> just walked in, shut my bag into the corner, walked off. Just before I went on stage, I went back to the corner where I'd left my bag. And it had been embroidered. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? You just get a better class of vandal. You really do. <laughs> anyway, thanks a lot for listening. I've been Matt Kirshen. Take care. Cheers, bye. Uh, told me he's he's gone to visit a cry he's gone to visit a cryogenics lab.
right? With a view to future arrangements. And uh, an astonishing thing to do. Well, I, I, could, I was utterly gobsmacked. Would any of you uh, get yourself cryogenically frozen? No. <laughs> of course you wouldn't. It's absolutely, you really have to trust the people involved, because there's a lot of scope for mucking about. There, isn't it? <laughs> if you ever run a cryo lab, right, and there's no reason you shouldn't, the government are all for retraining, right? <laughs> if, if you ever find yourself running one of them, the great thing to do is start bringing people back to life somewhere they're really not expecting it. Like in the middle of Laser Quest, holding a gun, going, Oh my god, the future really is like this! <laughs> then they open the door. Then they open the door and there's a Tesco in a pizza hut. Oh, very funny, yes, well done. <laughs> Do you know, you, you know, they freeze people with helium. That's what they use to freeze people. Helium is the refrigerant. It's my, it's my favourite element, helium. And um, I have a favourite element. <laughs> Imagine how long it took me to lose my virginity. Yeah. <laughs> I never really lost my virginity, to be honest. It just sort of eventually wore off as I retired. <laughs> what I love about that is the fact that when they finally do bring Walt Disney back to life, he's actually going to talk like Mickey Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he meant to get frozen. I think it's all been a terrible error. He's going to be furious. I said, go ahead with Disney on ice. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready for your next act? Yes. Please welcome Loretta Main. <laughs> Hey, I'm Loretta Main. I won't insult your intelligence by telling you too much about myself. I'm sure, I read my article in NME magazine last week. It wasn't so much an article as an advert, but... <laughs> if anyone does need to hire a van, the offer still stands. <laughs> this first song came out of love. Originally, it was called You're Gonna Burn in Hell, but um, my agent said I was alienating my audience, so he renamed it isn't love a funny thing? <laughs> so you thought you'd fool around with her behind my back But you didn't see me coming with that baseball bat Once we were hugs and kisses, but that was all lies You're just like all those other guys So I took all your stuff and I threw it outside I covered it with kerosene and I watched it fry Then I called up your boss and I told him I had said called your mom and told her you were dead. <laughs> single blow to your head and as you fell to your knees with your last faithful cry I stuffed my cigarette out in your eye <laughs> this song holds a warning for all those who cheat remember women wear stilettos on their feet and rings on their fists and daggers in their glare so if I were you I just wouldn't dare ain't it funny how your life was once so swell what a shame you're gonna Don't worry, he didn't die. But I did tell the ambulance guy the wrong blood type, so at least now he knows what rejection feels like. <laughs> the song's in my new album, I Had Your Baby, But I Threw It In The River. <laughs> Should be released as soon as social services give me back the demo. <laughs> Keep an eye on me, because I'm a genius. So I am like Van Gogh, yeah? You know, he painted stuff, no one liked it. I write stuff, no one likes it. Then go cut off his ear with a razor and sometimes I shave without soap. <laughs> I know where my problems come from. Yeah? I was bullied. I was bullied at school, huh? I was bullied by a girl called Sarah Perkins. Sarah Perkins. <laughs> well, guess what? School reunion's coming up. <laughs> so I wrote her a song. It's called Na 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 Na. <laughs> Knock, knock, Sarah Perkins, there's someone at your door. The girl you spat on daily and ground down into the floor. Well, look who found your house, Sarah, who scoured the phone book through. And now, Sarah Perkins, your fate is a wait 
I don't want you to think I'm entirely miserable. So I'd like to dedicate this last song to all the British men that I've loved and lost since I arrived here on Friday. <laughs> together just fine but then it's over and you start telling me how Cornish pasties should only be made in Cornwall and how champagne not made in champagne isn't really champagne it's just fizzy wine and I say fine you should have just shut up but you don't you carry on and on and on <laughs> so I take off my pants and we make love again start talking <laughs> you start telling me how Steve in your office took your stapler and when you asked for it back he said it was his he said no it isn't he said yes it is he said no it isn't he said yes it is he said no it isn't he said yes it is he said no it isn't he said yes it is I said what's the point of this story Charlie got a stationary cup and you can just go get another one he said that's not the point I said no this is the point and I wrap my thighs around your neck and we make love again. Oh, we make love. It's like the first time, the first time we touched each other's young thought flesh. And for a moment you are perfect. For a moment you are perfect. Then you start talking. <laughs> You start telling me about some league of football fantasy where you rank 323 out of the whole country, which is pretty good, actually. Considering you lost two to injury early on, but then how could you go wrong with Wayne Rooney in attack and Ashley Cole in left back? I said, why'd you go down the park, play some real football, get some real football kicks, get rid of those big old man tits? You said, it is just like real football. I'm just like a real football manager. And I say Get the hell out of my bed Never more dark in my door Cause the sex may be good But my God, you are a bore I'm Loretta Maine, thank you very much <laughs> Loretta Maine Also known as Pippa Evans She goes by two names it's uh, more to do with benefits, actually. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a tremendous pleasure to introduce you, Tim Vine! Do you know, someone's left a huge lump of plasticine in my dressing room. Yeah, I don't know what to make of it. <laughs> and I said to this Scotsman, I said, did you have spots when you were a teenager? He said, acne. <laughs> I said, I know everything there is to know about every single town and city in Scotland. He said, Mother, well. I said, a bit of arthritis, which is all right. <laughs> I'm on for two hours. <laughs> so this 
this bloke said to me, he said, whatever you do, don't mention deodorant. I said, sure, mum's a word. <laughs> but the scariest thing that ever happened to me, I was mucking about in a lesson, and the teacher made me stand outside. It was a flying lesson. <laughs> you see, the advantage of easy origami is twofold. <laughs> so one of the doctors, I said, I think I picked up an infection when I went swimming, because I got a swelling under my shoulder. He said, you're still wearing one of your armbands. <laughs> He said, you want to use my ice rink for two pounds? I thought, what a cheapskate. <laughs> Velcro, what a ripoff. <laughs> so I got home, my mum had filled up the garden with llamas. I said, what's going on? She said, you told me the one thing this house needed was a llama farm. I said, no, a fire alarm. <laughs> she said, how come I'm in all your jokes? I said, you're not in all my jokes. She said, I'm in this one. I said, this isn't a joke. <laughs> See? <laughs> You know, I, sp I spent the whole of today rearranging the furniture at Dracula's house. I was doing a bit of feng shui. <laughs> but I'd like to start tonight by, um... <laughs> I'd like to start tonight by telling you a little bit about my personality. I'm a very private and secretive person. That's it, really. <laughs> and during the Second World War, my grandfather couldn't stop scribbling. He got hit by the doodlebug. <laughs> I'll tell you something to warm your heart. Electrically heated lungs. <laughs> it's my girlfriend's birthday today. I bought her a giant helium balloon. That didn't go down very well. <laughs> I also bought some cutlery without knives and spoons. It's the fault that counts. <laughs> you know that weird silence you get when the audience thinks the joke hasn't finished, but in fact it has? <laughs> there it is. <laughs> so, um, this bloke said to me, he said, Tim, he said, as a young boy, was your mother very strict with you? I said, let me make one thing absolutely clear. My mother was never a young boy. <laughs> Mind you, she used to beat me with the telephone. Yeah, I was always on the receiving end. <laughs> and Dale Winton came up to me. He said, Tim, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He said, are you any good at impressions? I said, no. <laughs> Have you seen that film where, where, a, where a transvestite plays hide-and-seek in a zoo? Crouching Tiger, Hidden Drag Queen. <laughs> so I bought this DVD and the extras said, deleted scenes. I went and looked, there's nothing there. <laughs> See, last night I dreamt I was the author of Lord of the Rings. I was talking him asleep. <laughs> well, you've got to have a hobbit. There's the extra one. <laughs> so I said to this bloke, I said, did you know Marie Osmond is about to appear in the world's worst film? He said, Warner Brothers. I said, I already have. <laughs> So I went to the record shop, I said, what have you got by the doors? He said, a bucket of sand and a fire blanket. <laughs> I said, can you recommend some music for a kid's party? He said, small faces. I said, of course they have the kids. <laughs> I said, I want some music to play in the car. I'm driving from London to Newcastle. He said, Bjork. I said, no, Badurham. <laughs> and what's all this fuss about the iPod? Plays you 5,000 songs in a random order over a one month period. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't that called the radio? <laughs> Because the reason why everyone's against animal testing, ladies and gentlemen, is because the tests are not interesting enough. They need to plough money into that, make them more interesting, and everyone will get behind it. For example, why don't they do tests like, how long does it take to get a kangaroo into a wetsuit? <laughs> if you put a frog on a trampoline, do they cancel each other out? <laughs> if you sellotape a tortoise to the front of a Formula One car, at what speed does he close his eyes? Have you seen my new reality TV show where religious insects go climbing? It's called I'm a Celibate Flea, get in mountain gear. <laughs> lizard, lizard, lizard. Is there a gecko in here? <laughs> but it's important to look out for old people, isn't it? I came out of the supermarket, this old lady had dropped a purse, she couldn't quite reach it. And she said, can you help me? I said, sure. So I put my hand on the back of her head and bent her the rest of the way. <laughs> you know, I was on a fairground ride the other day, one minute I was laughing, the next minute I was crying. It was an emotional roller coaster. <laughs> So I was at this party, this bloke came up to me, he said, I just got off with one of the cheeky girls and I didn't enjoy it. I said, pull the other one. <laughs> I said, I want to be a film editor. He said, why? I said, to cut a long story short. <laughs> so I went to the doctors, he said, you've got hypochondria. I said, not that as well. <laughs> but you know, at the moment I'm reading My Life by Bill Clinton, which freaked me out because I didn't know he knew anything about my life. <laughs> and this bloke said to me, he said, I've got bubonic plague. I said, don't give me that. He said, I don't like interpreters, so I said, speak to yourself. <laughs> he said, can you tell me what you call someone who comes from Corsica? I said, Corsica. <laughs> he said, the trouble... 
The trouble with an all-day breakfast, you've got to eat it so slowly, haven't you? <laughs> so I went to the sweet shop and said, do you do Twix? He said, I'm quite good at juggling. <laughs> My local police chief does a talk on heroin, so you can't understand any of it. But you know, I was the victim of crime recently, ladies and gentlemen. I was, uh, I was at Victoria Station in London, and, uh, and uh, I, I got mugged. And, um, and then I burst into tears, and a policeman came up to me. He said, I'm fining you ten pounds. I said, for crying out loud. He said, yes. <laughs> he built up a photo fit. And I looked at the photo fit. It looks exactly like me. So he took me in for questioning. He said, where were you at five o'clock? I said, I was at Victoria Station. He said, it's not looking good, is it? <laughs> I said, I've got to go to court and a drink driving charge. He said, is it the old Bailey? I said, no, Harvest Bristol Cream. <laughs> he said, why don't you drink non-alcoholic wine? I said, Schlur. He said, why don't you drink non-alcoholic wine? <laughs> Tequila, snap, sambuca. I'm calling my shots. <laughs> so I said to this bloke, I said, punch me in the face. And he punched me in the face. And when I was lying on the ground, I thought, I asked for that. <laughs> but it's strange, isn't it? You stand in the middle of a library and go, ah, 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 and everyone stares at you. Do the same thing on an aeroplane. Everyone joins in. I said to I said this, but I said, can you tell me um, how I can find out when's the next train from London to Glasgow? He said, why don't you look online? I said, it's a bit dangerous, isn't it? <laughs> I've got a friend who always wants to be run over by a steam train. When it happened, he was chuffed a bit. <laughs> so I went on a cycling holiday. It was the most exhausting thing I've ever done in my entire life. I've got to get a smaller caravan. <laughs> so I went to the computer shop. I said, whenever I plug in my laptop, it overheats. He said, that's not a laptop. It's a George Foreman Bar and Grill. <laughs> Hey, you have been a sensational audience. And here comes the second half of my act. <laughs> so, I, you know, the other day I had dinner with my boss and his wife, and it was a complete disaster. My boss's wife said to me, she said, Tim, how many potatoes would you like? I said, I'll just have one. She says, all right, you don't have to be polite. I said, all right, then. I'll just have one, you stupid cow. <laughs> You've been listening to Four Stands Up with me, Chris Addison. Matt Kirshen, Pippa Evans as Loretta Main, Tim Vine. The producer was Sam Michel. Yeah!